the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, welcome to worship this evening at Church of the Servant. It's a gift to be with you all uh, on this brisk evening, a glorious fall evening. Uh, a few reminders. Uh, we do ask that you wear your mask as you're moving about, but once you're seated and if you feel comfortable, you're welcome to remove your mask. Uh, but we would ask you when we sing to put your mask back on. And as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship, let's settle in, breathe, and remember that the Spirit of God is here with us. save us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Praise the Lord. And now as Christ has shown us his peace, let us pass the peace to one another. And you may do so by waving or bowing to people in circles nearby, but please stay in your circle. i 
Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. Now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger, you who have been my help. Do not cast me off. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. If my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Do not give me up to the will of my adversaries. For false witnesses have risen against me, and they are breathing out violence. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. The Lord is my light, my light and salvation. Light of the world, shine in our darkness. Savior of the world, come into our hearts. There is much we should fear if we faced this day alone. Help us to hear your word and to trust in you. Amen. The Old Testament scripture comes from Isaiah chapter 58. On the day when you fast, you do as you please. You take advantage of all your workers. When you fast, it ends in arguing and fighting. You hit one another with your fists. That is an evil thing to do. The way you are now fasting keeps your prayers from being heard in heaven. Do you think that is the way I want you to fast? Is it only a time for people to make themselves suffer? Is it only for people to bow their heads like tall grass bent by the wind? Is it only for people to lie down in ashes and clothes of mourning? Is that what you call a fast? Do you think I can accept that? Here is the way I want you to fast. Set free those who are held by chains without any reason. Untie the ropes that hold people as slaves. 
Set free those who are crushed. Break every evil chain. Share your food with hungry people. Provide homeless people with a place to stay. Give naked people clothes to wear. Provide for the needs of your own family. Then the light of my blessing will shine on you like the rising sun. I will heal you quickly. I will march out ahead of you, and my glory will follow behind you and guard you. That's because I always do what is right. This is the word of the Lord. And the New Testament scripture comes from chapter of Matthew chapter 6. When you go without eating, do not look gloomy like those who only pretend to be holy. They make their faces look sad. They want to show people they are fasting. What I, what I am about to tell you is true. They have received their complete reward. But when you go without eating, put olive oil on your head, wash your face, then others will not know that you are fasting. Only your father, who can't be seen, will know it. Your father will reward you because he sees what you do secretly. This is the word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. I wondered if uh, we would all be too cold tonight, and I, I thought, I don't want people to be uncomfortable. And then I was reminded I, I'm preaching a message on fasting, um, which is about cultivating a certain level of discomfort. So maybe uh, the weather is fitting tonight. Well, we live in a culture of comfort and the idea of fasting seems strange, um, if not unhealthy. Who fasts? Seriously, who does that? Maybe some monks somewhere? And yet, we've been listening to Jesus' teaching on prayer in the month of September, and here, right after prayer, comes fasting. And Jesus uh, doesn't command that we uh, give generously. Um, Jesus doesn't command that we pray. Jesus doesn't command that we fast, but Jesus assumes all of this. So in his teaching, he says, when you give alms, do this. When you pray, do this. When you fast, do this. Jesus assumes that his followers will do these practices. So there's no biblical command to fast, we can't find one in Scripture. But if you go through a list of names of those who fast in Scripture, it's pretty much a who's who of the Bible. Moses, David, Elijah, Esther, Daniel, Anna, Jesus, Paul. And even within our own Protestant tradition, uh, there's Luther, Calvin, Knox, Wesley, Edwards. All of these disciples fasted. And here we are in the year 2020, when most churches in America have been fasting from fasting for quite some time. When Richard Foster set out to research the spiritual discipline of fasting, he could not find a single book on the subject between the years 1861 and 1954. About a hundred years, hardly a word on fasting. What's up with that? Well, Foster suggests two reasons. First, that fasting has been taken to extremes, um, especially during the Middle Ages. It, it comes with baggage for us, this idea of fasting. So I think subsequent generations have been right to be suspicious of fasting because it can become legalistic. Foster says whenever there is form devoid of spiritual power, law will take over because law carries with it a sense of security and manipulative power. Legalism, religious hierarchy, that those who are extra spiritual will do this. Guilt, a desire to control 
God by what we do. None of these are the way of Jesus. The second reason Foster suggests is that the American church is fasting from fasting because we live in a land of abundance, but we are formed by a mindset of scarcity. Most of us have pantries full of delicacies that King Solomon couldn't have imagined, but we're also told at the same time that we need more. We need more and more and more. There's never enough. We're fed with this propaganda to convince us that if we don't have three large meals a day with snacks in between, we're on the verge of starving. The words of John Wesley seem fitting here. Some have exalted religious fasting beyond all scripture and reason, and others have utterly disregarded it. It seems obvious what our pitfall might be. So I wonder if our task is to recover a practice of fasting that avoids the pitfall of legalism on the one hand and cheap grace on the other. A fasting not sparked by guilt and fueled by obligation, but instead a fasting sparked by a holy desire and fueled by love and a desire for justice, as we heard from the prophet Isaiah. Jesus' main concern in his teaching on charity and prayer and fasting is the condition of our heart. What's the intent? What's beneath the surface? What's behind the practice? What is the fire that's fueling this? Jesus lived uh, among Pharisees who practiced fasting two days every week, Monday and Thursday, every week. Do you know why they fasted on those days? That was market day. They knew the crowds would be out in the streets. And when the Pharisees fasted, they fasted. They did it big. Ashes on the face. Oh, look how miserable I am. I'm fasting. And Jesus was responding to this abuse. The Greek in verse 16 is, is more literally, they disfigure their faces to, so as to shine before people. Their egos were the stars of their spiritual performance. And yet Jesus says, don't announce how much you give. Don't pray to impress people. Don't advertise that you're fasting. Does anyone recall Jesus' very first words in the Gospel of John? It's a question. He asks two of John the Baptist's followers, what do you seek? Can also be translated, what do you crave? What are you hungry for? What are you hungry for? That question drills down to the core of who we are. What do we really desire? What do we crave? We know what the Pharisees craved. They wanted approval and attention and praise from others. And Jesus said they got it. They've received their reward in full. But what do you crave? The practice of fasting is meant to excavate our cravings, to bring to the surface the desires that move us in life. What do we crave? Well, fasting from food is the most obvious and common um, practice of fasting, but it's not the only thing we crave, amen? We all crave different things. But if you want to understand craving, try to take a smartphone away from a millennial, then you'll see desire. (laughs) But this gets really practical really fast. If we think about the things that that we crave and, and that we're moved by, to slow down and ask ourselves, Why do I feel such a strong desire to watch a TV show every night and to have a big bowl of ice cream? What is that about? 
why, why do I feel that need? Is there something I've done to earn that because I've worked so hard? Or is this the only thing I have energy for? Or will this actually restore me? Is this actually life-giving? Or am I avoiding something else? What's beneath the surface? What is behind it? What do we crave? When we let Jesus ask us that question, we confront what we've buried beneath the surface. Perhaps a deep loneliness, perhaps pain from trauma we've lived through, perhaps we're addicted to noise and busyness because we're avoiding something else. What do we crave? So, should I feel guilty if I'm not fasting? Should I be fasting? Ah, that word should, should. That belongs to the world of law. But Jesus ushers in a kingdom of grace and he invites us into that kingdom, a new way of being. And the Christian life and all the practices it entails is about a response of love to a love which has found us. And we seek to give generously because God has been generous to us. We struggle on in prayer because we know that God speaks our name and we want to hear his voice. And we might try fasting because we, we hunger more for God than for anything, even if we're avoiding it. The real gift of the spiritual disciplines, including fasting, is that they really don't matter in and of themselves. There isn't a Christian discipline or a Christian practices. There are many ways to God. They are never an end in themselves. They are about facilitating a relationship. They can help us be more present to God who is constantly present to us. John Calvin says that fasting is joined with prayer as an aid to it and warns that it is of no importance of itself except as it serves this end. Jesus warns that giving and prayer and fasting are for God alone in our life with God, not to impress others, not to atone for something. Fasting doesn't earn us a thing because we've been saved by grace from start to finish. Now that's not the same as having to feel like giving or praying or fasting in order to to do those things, please don't base your charitable giving on how you feel on a Sunday morning. Please don't do that. My children asked you, um, ask you that. Dallas Willard says, grace is not opposed to effort. It is opposed to earning. Grace is not opposed to effort. It is opposed to earning. So yes, these are practices. They're called disciplines for a reason. There is effort involved, but they're not a law governing us. They're not a weight around our neck. They shouldn't be a source of guilt, and they're not even a badge of honor if we do them. Maybe here's a test. If we ask ourselves, does this practice or discipline taste of freedom in Christ? Does it taste of freedom? Does it feel like we can freely give ourselves to God in this? and a freedom to enter into solidarity as well, solidarity with those who hunger daily in this world, who hunger daily, or those who hunger for justice much closer to home. Can a practice help us enter into solidarity and prayer for these sisters and brothers? As soon as a practice begins to feel, feel binding or guilt-ridden, just throw it away, throw it away because the practice is about facilitating our life with God. It is not an end in itself. But, but we might try. If the Spirit is stirring something in our hearts, if we sense the Good Shepherd's, shepherd's gentle leading to try fasting without obligation or guilt, we might try. Who's to say what the Father might reveal to us in that secret place? Remember, if the Son has set you free, you are free indeed, and that is good news.
In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. heads in prayer. O oh God, who is light in the darkness, we pray for those among us who work in places of darkness around our world. For them and for us, protection in the dark. O oh God, who is the bright morning star, we pray for those among us who grieve the loss of loved ones, the failing of health, or the flight of security. Be for them and for us a sure defense and the promise of a new day. O oh God, who is sight to the blind, we pray for those among us who are blind in soul, mind, or body. Be for them and for us, both courage and sight. O oh God, who is strength to the overwhelmed, we pray for those among us who are weighed down by temptation, those who are in danger, those whose enemies are close and whose help seems far away. Be for them and for us a present fortress against our foes. O God, who is salvation to the lost, we pray for those among us who have never found your way or who have strayed from your path. Be for them and for us a beacon that guides us safely home. O oh God, who is comfort to the fearful, we pray for those among us who live in fear of violence and injustice, who li whose lives are torn by war, whose thoughts are confused by mental illness, or whose souls and bodies are ravaged by abuse. Be for them and for us consolation and surety against anxiety. Give us wisdom, O oh God, to turn to you in times of stress, fear, and grief, in times of blindness, temptation, danger, and perdition. Grant us patience to wait for you and courage to be strong in your might. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord is my light, my light and salvation, in God I trust, in God I trust, the Lord is my light, my light and salvation, in God I trust. In God. 
I didn't have to ask you to stand. Everyone's ready to go. <laughs> Friends, uh, as we do prepare to depart, you are welcome to place an offering in the bowl at the table on your way out. Um, feel free. Now let us uh, respond with this sending. In thanksgiving, we now leave this place to serve our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, as we go in grace, receive this blessing from the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord's countenance be lifted up to you and give you peace. Amen.